from everyone can you hear me yes ma'am so how is everybody uh, the big question is ki jo aapko ye time period mil gaya for your studies are you utilizing it or not hmm Are you using it for your for your benefit? या फिर ये इसी तरह से जाया हो जाएगा कोई बात नहीं अब तो आगे होगी और पता नहीं कितना आगे होगा Yes, ma'am, we utilizing it. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am, utilizing. और तारा से चौलीजी किसी ने पढ़ी है कि नहीं पढ़ी? As I said, कि you need only fifteen. I need only fifteen minutes for of your time during the day to just. Go through parasitology just for fifteen minutes. Anybody done that? No. You can. So at the end, it will all pile up on you. Anyways, we started with the parasitology and we completed the protozoology. The second part of parasitology was helminthology, and in the helminths, we again subdivided them into two groups. Number one were the cystodes. and number 2 were the or or uh, number 1 were the platyhelminthes or the flat worms and number 2 were the nematelminthes or the uh, or the round worms the platyhelminthes or the flat worms were further subdivided into different groups and one was the cystodes and amongst the cystodes you have already uh, done tinea solium and tinea saginata h nana and diphyllobotrium latum a lot of questions are asked on the differences between tinea saginata and tinea solium both in the wild said anybody said something any question so most of the time you would get a question between, for uh, in uh, about the differences between tinea solium and tinea saginata and you will also get a question on uh, diphyllobotrium latum especially in the viva because it's a very important cause of vitamin b12 deficiency anemia or megaloblastic anemia so when your viva starts in parasitology very common question is what are the different types of anemia which can be produced by the parasites and one of them is the megaloblastic anemia vitamin b12 deficiency anemia and when you say that then the uh, the viva is going to proceed in the direction of the what is the definitive host what is the intermediate host of diphyllobotrium latum today we are going to start with a very important or we are starting going to study a very important organism which is echinococcus granulosus over the years its the uh, incidence has decreased but even today it is very a uh, common all over the world so just let's skip all of this which we've already done and uh, let's move on to a kind of corpus granulosus which is also known as a kind of corpusis the disease is known as a kind of corpusis or hydatid disease because it produces a cyst which is known as the hydatid cyst it's an accidental infection of humans with a dog tapeworm big basically the definitive host is the dog and other canine animals and this tapeworm it lives in the uh, in the body of the canine and it forms the adult uh, adult uh, 
uh, form of the parasite in these canines and the stool is going to be to be containing the ova of these parasites and when these ova are taken up by the intermediate host then they are going to produce infection in those intermediate hosts intermediate hosts could be the sheep cattle goat any uh, herbivorous animals which are grazing on the fields humans are an accidental host because when they are dealing with those cattle or when they are dealing with the dogs which harbor the tapeworm then they are going to become infected with the echinococcus so the disease is more common in uh, cattle growers in herders in hunters who have close contact with dogs and that may feed on contaminated wild herd animals geographically it has a worldwide distribution the larval form is found in man and in man it is going to be the end stage of the disease or the parasitic infection because once the hydatid cyst is produced in man it cannot proceed any further in the other animals it uh, like the sheep and the goat the cycle can continue because when the sheep and the goat they die off the hydatid cyst can be eaten by the canines and the adult worm is going to develop in them and the cycle would be repeated so the definitive host in case of the uh, uh, in case of a pinococcus are the dogs and the canines which are going to take up the scoliosis these are the uh, structures in the hydatid cyst and we just discussed them and these going they are, they are going to convert into the adult tapeworms in the intestine and then they are going to uh, to uh, pass out the eggs in the feces which are then going to be taken up by the sheep and other herbivorous animals and these sheep and other animals they are going to be eaten up by the dog when they are going to die and they are then going to take up the hydatid cyst which again the cycle would be repeated and this cycle can also uh, occur in humans as well but in humans there is no not going to be any continuity of the cycle because it's an end stage cycle in the humans until and unless that uh, because they cannot the dogs and canines they cannot feed on the hydatid cyst which is present in the humans until and unless that person dies in the wild and is being attacked by these canines so the larval form is going to be found in man sheep goats adult form is going to be found in dogs so remember whenever you are writing down about the lab diagnosis of pinococcus there is no role of stool examination of the humans in case of the diagnosis of a pinococ the first thing which you are going to write in the lab diagnosis is stool examination and stool examination in man does not have any value it does not give you any diagnostic uh, uh, positivity mode of transmission the canines they feed they are going to feed on the viable echinococcus granulosus they are going to pass the eggs and these eggs can be transmitted through the dog's fur handling the dog's fur through contaminated water vegetable soil or other fomites either through the hands or through food or water which becomes contaminated and if these viable eggs they are ingested by human beings then the cycle is going to start in human beings as well morphologically it is the smallest of all the tapeworms it has three proglottids and it has a a head which is known as the uh, and it has a rostrum which is the uh, topmost portion and this is having 28 to 40 hooks in two rows and there are four suckers and you've studied the morphology in case of tenia satinata and tenia solium and since they are all flatworms the, this morphological feature of the head and neck that helps us in differentiating between the various species so this is a picture of the adult worm and this is the close up of these uh, rows of uh, um, hooks and the uh, suckers the suckers are going to help in the attachment of this parasite to the intestinal wall the eggs are excreted in the dog's feces they are not going to be found in the humans so whenever you are writing the lab diagnosis please please do not write down the uh, the presence of eggs in human feces morphologically they are going to be similar to the 
eggs of tenia satinata and tenia solium. They are brown in color because they are stained by the bile. They are radial striations and they will contain an embryo with three hooklets. These eggs are going to be found in the in the fecal matter which is excreted by the dogs or other canine animals. The larval form of the parasite is known as the hydrated cyst. It's a, a rounded structure which has different layers around it and it grows at the rate of one centimeter per year. The commonest sites are the liver, lung and the bone and the hydrated cyst is going to contain a specific structure in which they are going to be multiple capsules, root capsules, and they will contain the scoliosis or the infected form of the parasite. If the cyst ruptured spontaneously or during surgical removal, there is going to be a severe anaphylactic shock. So whenever a hydrated cyst is being treated and is being removed surgically, because that is the main treatment of the condition, it has to be done very meticulously, ensuring that no fluid leaks into the uh, into the tissues. This is a hydrated cyst, and most of the time, in case of a kinofocus granulosis, it is unilock. It's a unilocular cyst. That is, it has only one uh, cyst form, which is present in the liver. The hydrated cyst has various layers. The outermost layer is a reaction of the fibrous tissue of the host to the presence of this parasite, and Inside is going to be the reaction of the parasitic. It's a, this is from the parasitic layer and this is from the, uh, from the host layer. Then you have these uh, brood capsules and these are produced from the surface of the inner layer of the, uh, of the cyst. And these brood capsules will then have the uh, invaginations and through a process of invagination, they are going to produce small structures which are known as the cyst. Uh, uh, the, which are known as the larval form. And this brood capsule, when it breaks down, it is going to be in small pieces, and this is going to be known as the hydrated sand. These small structures which are infective, they are known as the protoscolysis, and these protoscolysis, they are uh, sort of, uh, uh, you can just remember that they are the invaginated forms and which are going to uh, open up when they go into the intestines. So hydrated sand is made up of a lot of uh, a large number of these uh, scoliosis. So whenever this hydrated sand is taken up by an uh, by a canine, it is these forms which are going to be infective and they are going to when ingested, they are going to open up to produce an evaginated cyst form or the larval form. And this is going to with all these suckers, it is going to get attached and develop into the adult form. A kinococcus granulosis usually forms one large fluid filled cyst that is a unilocular cyst contains in hundreds of thousands of protoscolysis and many daughter cysts within the large cyst. So this is one cyst and within it, these are the brood capsules, but it can also form smaller cysts as a component of the hydrated cyst. Individual protoscolysis lying at the bottom of the large cyst, they constitute the hydrated sand and the cyst acts as a space occupying lesion. It is putting pressure on the adjacent tissues and this pressure is going to produce various signs and symptoms in an individual. So this outer layer, as we've discussed, is produced of, uh, by the host and it is a fibrous tissue. It contains a large, this hydrated uh, cyst is going to contain a large number of antigens which can sensitize the host. That is why during removal, we say that these antigens, that if they leak into the peritoneal tissue, they can cause the anaphylactic talk, shock. This uh, uh, can occur, uh, this shock can also occur spontaneous, uh, after spontaneous rupture of the cyst or during trauma to that area. And this, once this is ruptures, the protoscolysis can spread throughout the body. This is the gross picture of the, uh, of the liver showing you the hydrated cyst. Coming to the life cycle, this is the picture which is, uh, uh, I think, in your books. And uh, dog and other canines, they are the definitive host and the intermediate host are the sheep, goats, and swines. And uh, the um, eggs, they are passed out in the fecal matter of the 
definitive host. This is taken up by the intermediate host, the sheath in uh, the body of which in the liver and the lungs, the hydrated cyst is going to develop when this sheep dies. The uh, uh, canines and the other Arabian dogs, they are going to feed on the meat of this intermediate host and they will take up the, uh, the uh, pieces of the hydrated cyst. And from here, the protoscolix will emerge and this protoscolix will then uh, evaginate and it will attach to the intestines, grow into the adult worm uh, into the adult worm in the uh, intestines of the definitive host and start the cycle all over again. These embryonated eggs which are passed out in the fecal matter of the dog, they can during mix, during the handling of the dog or during contamination of water and the uh, food can be ingested by human beings but once they are ingested by the human beings they will go and settle down in the body of the individual, they can produce a cyst in the liver, in the lungs, in the uh, brain, in, uh, in the, uh, any way in the body, these cysts, they can develop. But since the humans, they are going to be the dead end host, now the cyst will remain within the human body. It can produce signs and symptoms, but it is not going to be transmitted to the intermediate host. So the cycle ends in case of the definitive in, in case of man, but in case of uh, the intermediate host, it is going to continue in this way. So let's skip this. Uh, when the uh, embryo is released from the intestine, it is, can go into the blood and from the blood, it can pass into the various tissues. In 80 to 90% of the cases, it is going to settle down in the liver or the lung, but the liver is the main site of development of the hydrated cyst. And this hydrated cyst can grow for 10 years or more, and it can accumulate a lot of fluid, even at times more than one liter of fluid will be present in the cyst. Now, what happens, different sequelae which can occur with the, an infection with Pinococcus granulosis include number one is the hydrated cyst in the liver, as a result of which they can be hepatomegaly and the pressure symptoms associated because of the enlargement of the liver. Then the cyst could rupture, it could rupture spontaneously, it could rupture as a result of trauma to that area or during surgical removal, and it can lead to an anaphylactic or an allergic shock in an individual which can be so severe that it can result in the death of the individual. Or these cysts, they can settle down in the peritoneal cavity and produce peritoneal cysts. Apart from a liver infection, it can go into the bones, it can go into the lungs, brain, uh, and uh, any other organ in the body and act as a space occupying lesion. And it will produce the symptoms depending upon compression of the adjacent tissue. The laboratory diagnosis in case of a gynococcus or the hydrated disease is suggested by the number one, the history, number two, other radiological findings, and number three, are the serological tests. When we carry out a blood examination, it is going to show you a uh, uh, moderate eosinophilia in 25 to 50% of the patients. And this is a reaction to most of the eosinophilia is present in most of the parasitic infections. Then we can take out the hydrated cyst and we can examine the fluid to see the presence of the scolosis, the daughter cysts, the brood capsules, and the hydrated sand. So all of them will give us an idea about the presence of the cyst. X-rays are the main um, uh, diagnostic tool in case of a pinococcus. They are going to detect uh, the hydrated cyst in the lungs. You can get it done. You can see them on plain X-rays. You can, if these cysts are present in the body for a prolonged time period, they can become calcified. And once they are calcified, they can also be picked up by the pain X-ray. Then ultrasound, a CT scan, magnet, MRI, all of them, they are helpful tools for the imaging of the hydrated cyst. A skin test, which is known as the Cassoni's test. This is now obsolete, but basically it is similar to the 
hypersemic to the tuberculin skin test we uh, uh, studied and which was the second test which we studied last many topic kaun sa padhaya tha aapko which was the last topic which i uh, uh, taught you anybody can anybody give me an answer to this question even if you don't know just tell me we don't know can't you hear me clearly कनेक्टेड है कि नहीं है ऑल ऑफ यू कैन यू हेयर मी क्लियरली यस मैम सो व्हिच वाज द टॉपिक व्हिच वी स्टडीड लास्ट टाइम व्हिच वन चली गई कनेक्टिविटी लिस्ट में नहीं है इसमें नहीं हो रही है कनेक्ट नहीं है आई वाज सेइंग दैट व्हिच अदर टेस्ट apart from kusuni's test which we studied recently gives you a, it's a skin test and is an immediate hypersensitivity reaction we have done two tests of this sort what are their names ma'am montos test montos test the yes. tuberculin test yes montos or tuberculin test is the same so that was for which organism uh that was for mycoplasma tuberculosis it's not mycoplasma it's mycobacterium mycoplasma Myco mycobacterium sorry mycoplasma is a totally different organism okay so don't mix them up yes ma'am and which was the second which and another one was a parasite which parasite did we study about two days or three days back we studied leishmania and we did this another skin test in leishmania and that was also an immediate hypersensitivity reaction and in all of these tests we inject the antigen intradermally in one arm and we look for the presence of redness the presence of uh, induration or any other uh, feature which would indicate a reaction at that site so in case of echinococcus or the hydatid cyst we inject uh, a small amount of hydatid fluid antigen intradermally into the arm and the positive reaction would be seen as a wheel with multiple pseudopodia which occurs within a half an hour and it fades off very quickly in an hour or so but there are a lot of false positive reactions so this is a less sensitive case and at present it's an obsolete test so this is the reaction which you can see on kosoni's test it's much milder as compared to what we saw in case of tuberculin skin test most important is the sero diagnosis in case of a cyanococcus and we have the various serological tests like the complement fixation test indirect magnification test counter immuno electrophoresis elisa radio immuno assay dot elisa indirect immuno fluorescence as i repeated we told you just remember these names and you can add them to most of the parasitic infections uh, when you are writing their diagnosis h nana you have already studied any questions till this point any questions no ma'am no ma'am no so let's let's move on to the second component of the platyhelminthes and these other trematodes generally you get questions in the mcqs from this portion but once in a while you do get a short essay question as well but most of the time it is an mcq on trematodes and uh, 
they are subdivided into this is the uh, platyhelminth these which are subdivided into cestodes nematodes and the trematodes trematodes they are also known as the flukes and when we talk about them we are talking about leaf shaped parasites and their size may be 1 to 10 cm most of them are hermo hermaphroditic that means both the sexes are present in the same organism but in the same parasite but in case of schistosomes which is one subclass of the trematodes they have separate male and female parasites Another thing which we need to remember about the schistosomes is that it has one intermediate host. There are no reservoir hosts. It does not have an operculum or a, a, or a flap which allows it to float. Infective form is the forked tail cercaria, and it's a cylindrical worm, and it, is, it has separate um, uh, uh, male and female parasites. So basically, when we talk about the uh, schistosomes, it has this morphology. And when we talk about the rest of the trematodes, it has the leaf-like structure, which is this morphology. So the major human trematode infections include uh, four types, the blood flukes, liver flukes, lung flukes, and the intestinal flukes. I'm just going to give you a brief important features of the schistosomes, which we are going to study today. Rest, you need to know the names and you need to know the diseases which are produced by them. So schistosoma parasites, they are called blood flukes. The adult flukes or the adult parasites live in the blood vessels of infected humans. Three main species. Number one is hematobium. Number two is mansoni, And number three is the japonicum. Definitive host in all three is the man. Whereas the reservoir host is going to be present in Mansonia and Japonicum, whereas in uh, uh, Schistosoma hematobium, there is no reservoir host. In Mansonia, it is the rodents, the monkeys, whereas in case of Japonicum, it is the domestic animals. Geographically, hematobium is found in Africa, Mansonia in Africa and America, Japonicum in Far East Asia and some parts of Africa. The eggs are going to help in the diagnosis of the species. So in case of Mansonia, we have the eggs in a, with, uh, uh, we have this characteristic elongated shape. And the most important feature and the question which generally is asked in the viva as well as in your MCQs is the positioning of the spine. Because in case of Mansonia, it has a lateral spine. In case of hematobium, it has an apical spine. So the point the spine is at the edge at the top in case of hematobium whereas it is on the lateral side in case of the mansonia in case of japonicum the uh, eggs are more rounded and they do not have a very prominent spine it's a small spine which can be seen on one side of the ovum but mostly you are asked the difference between the position of the spine in case of mansonia and hematobium You have this table in your books. It gives you the mode of transmission, the main sites affected, intermediate host, diagnostic features, as well uh, as the areas which are affected. But if you can remember the mode of transmission, which in case of Mansonia, Japonicum, and Hematobium is through penetration of the skin. Mansonia, it's the veins of the colon which are affected, japonicum, it is the veins again of the small intestine and the liver. Hematobium, it affects the veins of the urinary bladder. All three have an intermediate host in the form of a snail. And they are going to, these are the, uh, the uh, vectors which are, or the hosts which are going to uh, uh, help in the development of this parasite. Then the diagnostic features would be the large lateral spine in case of Mansonia and a small lateral spine in case of Japonicum. If this is oval in shape, this is, uh, sorry, this is rounded in shape, the schistosoma Mansonia is oval in shape. And hematobium is also oval and it is a large terminal spine.
In case of these tristosomes, you do not have any insect vector. It is the circaria in the life cycle of these parasites which are going to penetrate the skin. And then once they go into the human host, they are going to develop into the adult worms and they are going to live in the mesenteric or the bladder veins where they are going to lay the eggs and over there, they are going to form the granulomas. The larval forms, they are going to be uh, passed out into the, uh, they, they are going to develop in the infected snail, uh, snails. Sorry. This is the life cycle of the parasite. These are the circaria which are released by the snail into the water and they are going to penetrate the skin in individuals who are, uh, in, uh, who are uh, either uh, working in the water, for example, fishing, or uh, they have a certain uh, occupations which, allow, which, which are involving the direct contact with the water. The circaria, when they go into the body, they are going to lose their tail and become histosomelae. And they will pass into the circulation, they will go into the portal blood and then into the liver. And in the liver, they are going to mature into the adult worms and the adult worms then are going to migrate to the mesenteric venule, uh, venules in the, um, uh, or the venules of the urinary bladder in case of Schistosoma hematobium. In the bladder, then they are going to die, and they are going to stay there. They are going to then start passing out the, uh, the ova in the urine in case of Schistosoma hematobium and in case of the feces in case of the other two species. These ova, then they are going to hatch in the fresh water. They will release the mirasidia and these are going to penetrate the snail tissue. And once in the snail, they are going to develop. And once they are developed, they are then going to be released into the uh, infective forms, which are the circaria. So you need to know that the infective form of the schistosomes is the circaria. And this is the intermediate host is a snail, whereas the definitive host is man. And the life cycle of the three is the same, except that the once the adult are, uh, worms are going to be formed, they are going to go and settle in the tissues depending upon the species. In case of hematobium, it's going to be the urinary bladder. In case of the tonicum and the mansonite, it is going to be the intestine. What are the different manifestations of the uh, blood flukes or the schistosoma, man, mansona, and japonicum and hematobium? All three are going to produce a dermatitis at the site of the penetration. Apart from that, those which are going to be uh, involved in the urinary bladder, they are going to produce cystitis, urethritis, and ultimately they will produce a bladder carcinoma. A very, very common MCQ and a viva question which parasite is associated with, uh, with a carcinoma. Schistosoma hematobium is associated with urinary bladder carcinoma. And the reason or the etiology is basically the irritation which is produced by the spine of the schistosoma hematobium when it is constantly um, uh, producing a, a friction and a constantly it is producing the uh, damage to the tissues in the urinary bladder. Mansona and Japonicum, they're in the intestine, so they will be associated with abdominal pain. They would be uh, blood in the stools. They could be peripotal fibrosis, hepatosplenomegaly, ascites, and CNS involvement in the later stages. Lung flukes, because they are present in the lung, peregrinomenus uh, vestimini, it can cause uh, a cough, it can cause pulmonary pain, it can cause TB-like features. Coming to the diagnosis, there are four different aspects of the diagnosis. Number one is the clinical, where we have a history of contact with infected water, and the clinical picture would be according to the stage of the infection. So the patient will either come to you with the uh, abdominal pain, if it is the schistosoma japonicum or mansonite, or he will come with the, uh, some urinary complaint. Then in the laboratory, we uh, need to, uh, number one, detect the eggs in the urine or the stool. And in case of hematobium, as you can see, there is the uh, lateral spine. In, this is, I think, this is wrong. I, uh, sorry, it's the wrong picture which has been 
added over here, but they should be a lateral, uh, they should be a, a, a straight spine. Then the blood examination shows anemia, eosinophilia, and leukocytosis. Serological tests are different types. They will help with the diagnosis. Then radiological imaging, which will help in, uh, in seeing the ova. The, it will also help in seeing the uh, calcified areas, which uh, result in the formation, uh, because there is a granuloma formation as a result of the persistence of these ova in the uh, tissues. Endoscopy, like cystoscopy, clonoscopy, all will help in the visual, uh, 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 in, uh, in seeing <clears throat> these parasites or the ova in the tissues. The schistosoma hematobium, lateral spine association with carcinoma bladder, I've already discussed this with so Any questions till this point? Anything which you would like to repeat or ask? Nothing? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. The eggs of which of the following histosoma species are elongate and have a lateral spine? Who can answer that? Ma'am, A. Alpha. Alpha. Are you sure? A. Let's go back. Which is this? Which species is this? This is hematobium. Hematobium. So it has a lateral spine. Okay. It is associated with C of the bladder. So what are we asking? Which has a lateral spine? Hematobium C. So, can you remember this? The Chistosoma hematobium has a lateral spine. Yes, ma'am. Hematobium has a T. Remember, hematobium has a T. And lateral has a T. So can you now remember that the lateral spine is present in which species? Um, book me the table has written it has a terminal spine, not what a lateral you? spine. Yes. Let me. Ma'am, up the graph the up my picture. Let me see, beta. Let me see. Uh, Sister Sohan Manson, I have the graph. 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 I'm sorry. I am wrong. Mansonai is has got a lateral spine and hematobium has a apical spine. Yes, you are right. Uh, it was my mistake. Okay, this actually threw me off. Okay. So it is Mansonai. Okay, uh, a host that harbors the larval or the asexual form of the parasite is known as the B. Intermediate host? Intermediate host. And which harbors the adult form that e. is known as the? Which harbors the adult form of the parasite that is known as what host? Definitive host. Definitive host. Definitive host. Definitive host. Yes. <clears throat> Motile reproductive stage of Antoniba histolytica is a trophozoid, a pre cyst, a cyst, or none of the above? A. A is yes, right. Montenegro test is used for the diagnosis of Palazar, hydrated disease, toxocariasis, or cysticercosis. Cysticercosis? D. D, no. Just hydrated disease. It's a hydrated disease. So, now we have a Sony's test. Alpha. Hmm? Kalazar. Kalazar. Because Abhi, I told you, Kalazar ka organism concept, positive organism concept. Leishman, uh, leishmaniasis. Leishmania, leish. So, leishmanias, leishmaniasis of Kalazar Montenegro skin test is used for that diagnosis. Giardia, trichomonas, toxoplasma, these are the few uh, topics 
which you need to know, but they are more commonly their MCQs, which are going to be um, coming from them from these uh, topics. And over the years, what I've seen is that you do once in a while get a question on SCQs on these topics, but most of the time, the MCQs are being generated from these topics. But that does not mean you do not uh, you uh, you uh, you can skip these uh, parasites. You also need to know what is the difference between viviparous, oviparous, and vivi oviparous. Anybody can give me the difference. Hemoparasites kya hote hain? What are hemoparasites? Parasites of the blood. Parasites which are going to be found in the blood. Hemoflagellates. Flagellated parasites that are found in the blood. Yes. What is the name of a hemoflagellate? What parasite is transmitted through blood transfusion? Um, malaria, plasmodium. Malaria, sharp part. And which parasite is associated with the uh, uh, with malignancy? I've just told you. In hematobium, that is an answer. Yeah. Toxoplasma. Toxoplasma. Oh, hematobium. Hematobium. Now we have to study this. Okay. Viviparous and oviparous are different. See here that oviparous is when they, lay, when they are laying the eggs. Viviparous when they are laying the larval form. Okay. Bubale parasites, especially these terms are going to be used in nematodes, which we are going to study uh, from tomorrow. Because this is going to finish your cystodes and trematodes uh, portion. And now we are going to move on to nematelmanthes or the nematodes. And inshallah, by Friday, we are going to finish with the whole of parasitology. Viviparis, oviparis is basically terms which you are going to now use when we are going to study the nematodes. Viviparis are those parasites which are going to uh, uh, pass out the larval forms in the stool. Basically, their eggs are passed out and they are going to hatch within the intestine and the fecal dirt through the fecal matter, it is the larval forms which are going to be passed out. Oviparous, the ova are going to be passed out and vivi oviparous when both the, uh, either the larval form or the ova can be passed out by the parasite. You need to know parasites causing food and waterborne diseases, which are the intracellular parasites, which are the parasites which are found in urine. Which is the parasite found in urine? I'm just to soma hematobium. Shabash. So dysentric causing parasites, anemia causing parasites. These are the small questions which you need to make a sort of notes on. They, you, you don't need to have a long list. You just need to have two or if it could be just like parasites found in urine, schistosoma hematobium, just one, uh, one line there. Anemia causing parasite, this you can divide into iron deficiency anemia, microcytic anemia, and into the megaloblastic anemia. And you can write one, one, one uh, or two parasites in front of each. These are the small viva questions which are asked very, very commonly every year because parasitology is something which everybody asks. If the person who is coming to take your viva is not even is not a microbiologist, he is a histopathologist, he'll ask you parasitology. If he's a chemical pathologist, he's going to ask you parasitology. If he's a hematologist, again, he's going to ask you parasitology. Because this is the easiest thing which everybody can remember. And they're very small questions. They are very common questions, which are known to everybody. So they start the viva with these small questions. So you need to be prepared for them before you uh, appear for your viva. And the only way which you can prepare parasitology is by 
writing down these uh, uh, points, writing down these small answers, which are going to help you in answering these uh, MCQs and these short kind of questions. Any other questions? Anything which you would like to ask? No questions? Any comments? हेलो स्टूडेंट नहीं बोल रहे हेलो यस सर ठीक है ओके आवाज आ रही क्लियर जी बिल्कुल आ रही है बेटा आप लोगों को मेरी आवाज नहीं आ रही थी मैम आ आ रही है अब आपकी अब आ रही है उस वक्त नहीं आ रही थी जब मैं आपसे पूछ रही थी एनी क्वेश्चंस नो नो मैम वी जस्ट हैड नो क्वेश्चंस ओके बेटा बट इफ यू डोंट हैव एनी क्वेश्चंस देन इट इज पोलाइट ऑफ यू टू टेल मी दैट नो इट्स ओके at least one one of you could say ki nahi everything is okay we don't have any questions at least i should have a response from you so that i know that i am at least reaching you my voice is reaching you in yes, this way in this way it feels like there is no connectivity and you cannot hear me you can so it's it would be very yes, uh, convenient for me if one of you uh, anybody can just say ki no ma'am we have understood everything or there are no questions here yeah? Yes. Finally, students, आगे से कुछ आंसर रिस्पॉन्स दिया करोगे